This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And so I want to give a special thank you to Stephen Frank, who just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 484 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Daryl Gregory. He's the author of novels such as Pandemonium and Spoonbenders, and his short fiction appears in magazines such as Asimov's and the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. His novella, We Are All Completely Fine, won the World Fantasy and Shirley Jackson Awards, and his novelette, Nine Last Days on Planet Earth, was a finalist for the Hugo Award. And we'll be speaking with him today about his short story collection, Unpossible and Other Stories, and about his new novella, The Album of Dr. Moreau. And now here's our interview with Daryl Gregory. All right, so we're here with Daryl Gregory. Welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, so first of all, just tell us about your short story collection, Unpossible. How'd that come about? Well, you know, I uh, the great thing about science fiction is you get to um, learn your craft by writing short fiction, <laughs> and you get to fail uh, quickly and get rejected quickly. Um, so I wrote short stories for years. I went to uh, the Clarion Writers Workshop when I was a young guy. And um, yeah, so I started out writing short stories, and just over time... Um, had a collection of them or a collection uh, worth of them. And uh, a friend of mine, Patrick Swenson, who runs a small press, he runs um, Fairwood Press, sort of hit me up at a con. He says, you know, <laughs> hmm. we could do a collection. I'm like, well, that sounds good. Why don't we do that? And it was that easy. It was like, it was one of those con bar conversations where like, I think I just entered into a business agreement and I didn't finish my <laughs> beer yet. Um, so it was lovely to sort of go through and, uh, you know, select those stories over the first, like, 15 years of writing, uh, including my first short story, which was, you know, back in 1990. Um, that was that was a lot of fun to do. Well, yeah, I was going to say the first thing that jumped out at me is that there's one story from 1990, and then there's a 14-year gap between that and the next story from 2004. So yeah. kind of... <laughs> So kind of tell us about like, how did that story end up kind of all off on its own uh, down there in 1990? Well, right. So I came out of Clarion in, I went to Clarion in 1988 and I sold a few short stories and uh, that was my first sale uh, to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, and then, then I did a thing that I don't recommend for anyone who's listening, who may be a new <laughs> writer, which is to uh, go on break. So basically um it was a hugely busy time in my life. Um, we were raising two kids, I, uh, married. Um, my wife was getting a uh, tenure. Um, so it was like this crazy busy time. And I decided, well, I'm hardly getting any writing time in. And I decided to write a novel. Uh, and I worked on that novel for like nine or 10 years. And, uh, it's completely unsellable. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a, the fact that later I broke it up into three separate short stories that had nothing to do with each <laughs> other uh, tells you a little bit about what was wrong with the novel. Um, but it was a great learning experience. And then by the time after this uh, long break, um, I had this opportunity to, um, my wife had gotten tenure and we were moving to a new place. And I had this opportunity to say, you know, I'm going to switch to halftime in my job. Um, and we could afford that finally and just devote more time to writing. So I'd work in the mornings for the software company and write in the afternoons. And that's really where everything sort of started to come back to me, you know, and I went back with uh, to short stories to, to get started again. And so there's a story in there called The Continuing Adventures of Rocket Boy, which is an idea I'd been noodling around with for years. But finally, when I got that break, I went back to it and said, oh, I know how to end this. I was waiting for an ending. Um, and a lot of it was just, I just needed to spend more time, but in chair, as Jane Yolen <laughs> says, that was the whole trick. I just needed to devote more time to writing. 
Uh-huh. Well, speaking of endings, I mean, for this first story in the wheels, you say that Samuel Delaney kind of told you how it needed to end at, at Clarion. Oh yeah. Well, the first thing he told me was like, you didn't finish. <laughs> he told me, mm-hmm. um, I wrote this story during Clarion and Samuel R. Delaney, who, if, if you've ever seen him, I mean, he looks like God. So, you, so, and he seems like you're meeting God too, <laughs> when you're, when you're 22 years old. Um, well, even now I think he's, he, he's, pretty damn impressive and intimidating, but he was so good. He said, um, no, you, you ended the story too soon. He's got to return home. That's where the story is. It sort of ended with sort of a big event with someone dying. And then he's like, no, your main character has to come back and face the music back home. And I was like, oh, he's right. So I spent the next few weeks at Clarion when I wasn't writing other weekly stories, going back and trying to flesh that story out. And then, um, he was right. And then when I showed it to him, he's like, okay, this is, this is going to be your first sale. Uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll recommend you to some people and, and hopefully this will help. And so it was just fantastic. He sort of saved that story. I, I mean, I love that advice of, you know, the character has to go home. I feel like that's good advice for ending many, many stories. It's sort of the Joseph Campbell right. thing. Right. It is. And in going home and, you know, there's something about that structure and I use it in novels all the time too, of coming full circle. The reader feels like they've been on a journey then, Um, you know, when you, you either have to return home emotionally or physically, or if you can pull it off both, you know, you have to come home because what's really interesting dramatically a lot of times is the after effects, especially in science fiction and fantasy, you can have these big technicolor events but if you skip the emotional um, damage that gets done from some of these things, uh, it, you know, it doesn't become a complete story for me sometimes. Yeah. I mean, in my uh, notes here, I have, your st- I have the stories in the book divided into a couple of categories. And one of them is neuroscience stories and one is superhero stories. And <laughs> yeah. then one is adults reckoning with their past stories. So you have mm-hmm. a, couple, a couple of these stories where a, an adult character returns to their hometown and you know, comes home somehow or revisits their childhood in, in some way. Right, right. Uh, that's, a, you know, and that's an ongoing thing with me. It's even in the novels. Um, I have, you know, my first novel that got published, the first publishable <laughs> novel, hmm. um, it's called Pandemonium. And it opens with a guy in O'Hare flying back home into Chicago to sort of deal with his problems. And it's and the root of everything is tied up in his childhood. So that's a thing. Family stuff uh, always keeps coming back. And sometimes, you know, I talk to other writers and sometimes you just do not have a choice about your themes. You can try to disguise them, but the things that bother you, you'll keep trying to work them out in fiction. And that's certainly true with me, uh, with families. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about the other categories too, the neuro SF (laughs) stuff and the, and the superheroes. No, we'll definitely come back to those. But when you said you the the Pantamonium was your first published novel, did you have that just that one unpublishable novel, or were there was there more than one unpublishable there, novel? There was just one, thank God, um, <laughs> because I I write slowly and recursively, which is an appalling sort of system. So writing recursively means I I write the first chapter, I rewrite the first chapter, I write the second chapter, I rewrite chapters one and two. <laughs> So by the time I get to the end of a novel, I've rewritten some of these chapters, you know, a dozen times. Um, so uh, I've never been able to find a different way of writing than that. Um, mm-hmm. So it goes slowly for me. And yeah, so I had this novel, that first novel just did not work. Uh, but I learned a lot of things. I learned that you can't put everything into a novel. It, it has to be you know, um, I had this idea as a short story writer that when I got to a novel, I'd be able to do everything. I would do class and race and sickness and health. I would do every, and then you don't have time. So you have to pick your, you have to pick your story and the book is the boss. You know, you have to follow what the book is telling you and, you know, leave other things for future books. I mean, if you could go back in time to before you wrote that or tried to write that novel and tell yourself either do it or don't do it. What would you say? Because, you know, do you think it was like you learned, you said that it was a learning experience. Like, like what, did you learn more uh, from that? Than oh, yeah, I, I learned a tremendous amount. I would never undo that massive failure. Um, and the problem was, is that, um, you know, you get to a certain level of craft and you can kind of fool your friends. 
uh, you can give them, I gave them copies of that book and they're like, wow, some <laughs> of these chapters are great, but it didn't add up. Like the, the novel has to work as a thing in itself. The structure has to work and it has to pay off emotionally in these ways. Just being good at sentences doesn't save you. And so I, I, I would never go back and try to undo that because I learned so much from failing so hard. Um, but the other tricky thing about it is you, sometimes when you fail hard, you pick up a lesson and you start using that in your writing. The thing I'm examining now after I've uh, written a few novels is, well, making sure I didn't learn the wrong lessons. Like, is that these rules that I set for myself, do I really need to follow them? Is there, can I be more experimental? Can I go and do things the wrong way and see if they work? So that's where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. That actually reminds me, one of the uh, quotes from your um, acknowledgments I wanted to ask you about, as you say, special thanks to Gordon Van Gelder and Sheila Williams, who were so kind to this newcomer and offered friendship and advice to a guy who was pretty clueless about the whole business. And I was just Oh, yeah. uh, I was just wondering if is, is there anything kind of um, noteworthy or um, funny about how you, in, in any ways you were clueless about? Oh, about the I, business? I, you know, I just had no idea what I was doing. I mean, um, you know, but I grew up not knowing any writers or didn't know how this whole thing worked. And I knew uh, vaguely I wanted to write stories and novels but it was like declaring that you're an alligator wrestler and you've never been an <laughs> alligator. It's like, I, <laughs> I don't know how to do this. Can someone please lend me even a fake alligator to get started <laughs> with? Um, and then, and then starting out, um, you know, both Sheila and Gordon were so great to me. They sort of took me out for lunch, talked to me about what I was doing. And the thing they did that was so gracious too, is they let me know, when I was on the right track and encouraged the weird things that attracted them to the stories. Um, you know, Gordon did me a great service. Like he, the story continuing adventures of rocket boy, which is in the collection and, and Gordon published. And that first story that I came back to when I started writing short stories, um, he actually said, look, this is not actually a science fiction story. Um, it's a mainstream story about science fiction. And he said, so I just can't take it. I can't buy the story. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. And then, um, but I said, you know, I really hope that people in science fiction would read it because it's about me as a reader growing up. And uh, I went on to write other stories for Gordon. And then he, then he came back to me and said, look, I can't stop thinking about that story. Let's run it. And he did run it, but with a disclaimer, <laughs> not for sex or violence, but for the for the disturbing lack of genre content. Um and it was that kind of graciousness and that willingness to talk through story ideas and him uh, telling me what he, he told me, what about my writing made me good fit for him as an editor. And uh, Sheila was so enthusiastic. These people are saints when they go and they rescue uh, new writers and sort of give them encouragement. I, I hope they know how much it means to people. That's really interesting about the continuing adventures of Rocket Boy. I don't want to give away the ending, but I thought there was definitely a sort of uncanny element at the end of the story. Oh, there's definitely. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to give away too much either, but it's an old story and it's just a short story. I don't mind talking about the ending, but there's a moment where the where the narrator, our protagonist, thinks that something incredible has happened. But there's not confirmation. There's not external proof of it. He just has this feeling that like it has happened. And so a science fiction reader will say it happened. <laughs> um, a mainstream reader will say, oh, this is a metaphor for those kind of epiphanies people have in New Yorker stories. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, you could have it in that story. You could have it either way. And I'm happy for people to, you know, to work that out on their own. Because there's uh, another quote I wanted to mention from Nancy. Nancy Kress wrote an introduction for the book, and she just says, none of these stories is set on a space station or an alien planet. And I was just curious, why do you, why do you think that is? No, no alien planets? Yeah, what is that? Um, I've yet still to write about alien planets, or even though I'm a huge fan of Ian Banks, there's no space opera uh, in my trunk or out in the world. Um, I don't know. You know, part of it is, the thing that gets me going are, are, 
I call it psychological realism in the face of surrealism. I really like this idea of like, let's have a completely sort of grounded person and have crazy things happen to them and sort of follow them. Um, and so I, I like the gritty shorthand of be, having a character say Colorado and the reader knowing about Colorado, and I don't have to describe it like it's Narnia. Um, so it's kind of a cheat in a way. Um, but so far, I, I'm really intrigued by things that are happening in the day-to-day -day and weirdness intruding. And that's all, where a lot of like the neuro SF stories come from is this idea of weird science about consciousness, about free will. I'm very intrigued by that stuff. And it, and it, I think about it in my daily life. So I tend to start from my own, you know, uh, quotidian sort of existence and extrapolate from there. Yeah, so let's let's talk about the neuroscience story. So, I mean, I was just blown away by this story, second person present tense. I thought oh, it was just you. a tremendous story, and that was kind of the the first of the neuroscience stories that you wrote, right? Yeah, it was. Um, I, you know, I've been thinking about stuff for a while. You know, and well, actually, continuing adventures of Rocket Boy has to do with this idea of: Am I a little self behind my eyes, like working the controls? Like, how much is my body related to my mind? And so the classic mind-body problem. So that was probably the first one. And then second person present tense just came about just to tell readers the or listeners the premise. Um, there's a drug that teenagers can take where it sort of uh, erases your consciousness temporarily. And your body keeps moving and keeps thinking and talking and doing things, but you are not there. Um, and this is sort of, you know, we... This is sort of based upon uh, a philosophical argument in consciousness called the zombie problem. You know, it's like, well, why do we need consciousness? We could do everything we're doing now, cogitate, talk, build things. But why do we need to have self-awareness as part of it? So it's the riddle of consciousness. So I thought, well, what if that goes away? And then she overdoses on this drug and then a new consciousness sort of steps in. And they know exactly what happened. They have access to, even to the old person's memories. But their identity, they do not feel like that person. They feel like a new consciousness. And the more I thought about it, it struck me as a whole metaphor for, for how it feels like sometimes as a, as a teenager growing up, you feel like you're becoming a new person. You have all these memories. And especially if you're uh, queer or you have something weird that you need to sort of get out of your family environment to find yourself, um, Sometimes that coming out process is a, is a lot like finding your true self and you have all your previous memories and then the parents have to somehow adjust to this. Their child who they raise has changed significantly, but it's still their child and they still love them. And so one of the lines in this story is, you know, you don't get to choose who loves you. So even if you're trying to break away from your parents, they can still love you. Um, and so as a, both a parent and as a person who was a weird kid growing up, I was attracted to not demonizing either side of that story. I liked the, I wanted to tell it from the parents' point of view so you could tell that they loved them even as they were befuddled by what had happened to their daughter and tell the story of the daughter who felt like a new person in an old body. In the story, there's this, it explains the way the mind works with this metaphor about the queen and the parliament. Where mm -hmm. did that come from? You know, I've been, I, I was reading a tremendous amount about how consciousness works and, um, and, and and the idea is, is basically, well, you need neurons in order to be able to do any thinking. So that means your brain is working on stuff uh, before you could actually even have a thought that you're aware of. So the metaphor there, and there's a, in a lot of these books about uh, how consciousness works, it's very clear that the brain is kind of a parliament. Um, it's not one thing. It's a bunch of competing nodes who are all throwing up ideas and somehow through some sort of process, uh, one of those decisions gets made. One thought happens, one uh, decision gets made. And then there's some neurochemical process uh, that delivers it to awareness to say, here's the thought you are having right now. The brain has been working on this. The parliament's been working on it. There's a chemical page who carries the message to the queen and the queen of consciousness sort of says, I am having this thought, even though it's parliament who decided your brain has decided, has done all this work for you. Um, but you think the illusion of, you know, of, of, of an I, of a self, you think you've done it. 
but really your brain has been doing all this work. Um, so I just thought that was a good metaphor to try to explain what's going on in consciousness and where this drug, this drug called Zen would interrupt and they'd be interrupting the page. The queen never gets updated with awareness. The brain keeps working, but the page is gone. Yeah. And, and so basically, yeah, once the, um, once this drug dis disrupts these neural pathways, then the brain eventually can't find the, you know, the conscious minds anymore and sort of, uh, uh, deputizes a new part of the brain to be the consciousness. And so you get this completely different different yeah. consciousness and different personality and stuff. Yeah. The queen is dead. Long live the queen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and here's the crazy thing. So I, I thought I'd made up this drug and this whole disorder and I got a letter. Uh, well, it was an email actually um, from a guy who's a professor and he's like, look, I read this story and this happened to me, except it wasn't a drug. It was a motorcycle accident. And when I woke up in the hospital, I knew I was a different person, but I wasn't as brave as your protagonist. I kept faking my way through it. And to this day, hmm. wow. I have a relationship with the person who is my mother, and I've grown to love her again. But in the hospital, I was faking it. He just was trying to get by, even though he knew he had nothing to do with that previous person who had the motorcycle accident. Yeah. Well, I mean, all these things, I mean, none of them are like tele telepathy or anything like that. I mean, they're, they're all things that seem like they could happen. Um, let me read a couple examples. So w in one story, a woman's vision freezes permanently on sort of the last thing she saw before an accident. And then no matter where she looks or what she does, she's just always seeing that same sight. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a guy who he he has the sense that his the seat of his consciousness has moved from behind his eyes into one of his fingers, and now he <laughs> sort of inhabits his finger. Um, there's a drug that makes sociopaths experience empathy by activating um, mirror neurons. Um, right. And then there's a uh, uh, let's see, a cult infects a woman with a prion disease that causes her to see Jesus. And then the next story that I really want to talk about is called Dead Horse Point. And there's this genius physicist, and she, when she starts thinking about math problems and things, she just kind of goes away, and her body is kind of on autopilot, and and these, um, you know, sort of uh, trips away mentally, kind of get longer and longer and longer as, uh, throughout her life. And you said that that was so sort of inspired by somebody you actually knew, right? Yeah. I mean, he wasn't uh, completely dysfunctional like my character was, but he was a, a really gifted mathematician. And when he was working on hard problems, he would, for days at a time, sort of drift around. He would eat automatically. He'd barely talk to people. He was deep, deep in the problem. Um, and he had to sort of stop doing that when he had kids, because um, you can't just walk <laughs> away from your children and you know come back three days later and see if they're okay. Um, but I was struck by this idea that, you know, we, all these things, all these sort of neurochemical processes that evolution has put into us to make sure that we don't drift away so much that the saber toothed tiger doesn't eat us. Cause all the people who did drift away, a lot of those people got weeded out of the gene pool, but there's still, obviously there's some evolutionary advantage to deep, deep concentration. Those people accomplish things. And so I just wondered like, well, what if through some accident of neurochemistry, a person was missing that thing that interrupted the flow of thoughts and they could keep coasting and coasting and thinking and thinking, you know, what would that life be like and who would have to take care of them? And, and I used to tell people, you know, it's sort of a story about Stephen Hawking's nurse, you know, somebody like being a genius has a cost and it has a cost in other people around you. So I was interested in writing about the people who have to support this genius uh, and the emotional cost on them. Right. I thought that was interesting because you said that in science fiction, usually the genius is the hero of the story and that you couldn't write this story until you realize, no, this isn't a story about a genius. It's a story about the people who, you know, have to, who, who support the genius and keep them alive. Right. Yeah, that was the thing that sort of lit me up. And I remember the exact moment I was in a train. I was leaving uh, the Worldcon in L.A. and going to visit uh, family in San Diego. And I had, a, I had about an hour and a half to myself. And I thought, well, I was all jazzed up from being around writers. And I thought I should – there's a story that doesn't bother me. There's got to be a way to solve it. And then just sort of hit when I realized 
the focus is wrong. Like it is about the people who support them. And as soon as I understood that, the whole story sort of fell together. It's about the handoff between one caretaker to another when the first caretaker is at the end of the rope. So you you said that you got, you sort of collect, for, when you wrote this, you know, the second person present tense story that you collected this big library of, uh, of sort of neuroscience books yeah. and then the other stories, they all kind of came out of that reading ultimately or? Yeah. Cause it's, you know, it's great to have uh, a job where you get to, f- you get permission to feed your hobby and buy as many books as you want. <laughs> um, and so I keep buying neuroscience books. I, I'm endlessly fascinated by that stuff. And so I'm always looking for ways to make that into stories. Um, I just had a story that's going to be in the best American science fiction um, collection called Brother Rifle, which is about the problem of uh, of decision-making Um the weird thing that ha- that we found out about decision making is that emotions are a big part of it. Like if you had your emotions cut off, uh, you wouldn't be become a really logical, you know, Mister Spock. You'd you'd probably become someone who had ver- a lot of trouble coming up with the decisions. People who have uh, neurological disorders where they're cut off from their emotions can't make a decision about sometimes easy things like should I pick up the blue pen or the black pen. Nothing feels right that a lot of times what we think is pure cognition is actually a feeling of correctness. We make a decision because it feels like the right decision, even if we can't logically go back down the chain of all the things that that parliament brain was working on. Um, So I was really interested in this idea of a guy who's cut off from his emotions and has to develop um, some neuroscientists are helping him uh, develop alternate ways of alternate pathways for making decisions. Uh, and in fact, uh, no one has ever caught this, but the the doctor, one of the doctors who shows up there is the same doctor that's in second person present tense. So there's a Daryl Gregory uh, uh, extended universe out there of neuroscience stories. <laughs> well, I mean, you also, I mean, the two superhero stories in this book are, are kind of, you know, uh, reference each other. So this is the illustrated biography of Lord Grimm and message from the bubblegum factory. Mm-hmm. And they're both kind of um, the the theme of both of them is kind of like about how people become villains because the superhero the sort of supposed superheroes right use their powers irresponsibly. Yeah, uh, you know, Lord Grimm came about from you know watching uh, the evasion of Iraq, and I was thinking about, um, you know, we we just bombed the hell out of the city, and. Uh, there were these people who through no fault of their own or completely innocence who died. And this continues to happen with drone strikes. And so it seemed to me that the, you know, the easiest way to turn a moderate person or an unpolitical person into a zealot or into, you know, any kind of true believer or a soldier uh, for the cause is to kill everyone around them. And I just thought about those sort of um, collateral damage that goes on in a lot of superhero stories and of course, if you were living on a, an island with basically Dr. Doom as your leader, even if you didn't care about him politically, well, if the superheroes come in and level your city uh, in order to take down the bad guy, of course you'd be um, uh, activated. You'd, you'd become uh, politically motivated. And so I was really interested in that idea. Um, and it's a really easy metaphor, of course, to go from superpowers to, you know, international superpowers invading a country. Right. Well, I mean, you know, um, Lord Acton had this saying that power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And, you know, we're really attached in fantasy and science fiction to this idea of of superpowered heroes and superpowered gods and stuff like that. And I always think about in terms of in terms of that idea, like, could you ever have a, a good hero or a good god if they were that powerful? Wouldn't they just inevitably be corrupted by that power. Right. Like how do you, what are the checks and balances, especially if you get a godlike figure like Superman? And there's, since I've written those stories, I mean, there's been plenty of, um, there's been plenty of comics and uh, TV shows like The Boys uh, where, who who examine this idea. Um, but for me, you know, uh, in, uh the, the other story you mentioned, it's basically a Superman and Jimmy Olsen story 
where the Jimmy Olsen character sort of realizes, wait a minute, this is a pocket universe that somehow this guy has built for himself so he could be the hero. And he was just a jerk back in his home, uh, in his home dimension. And he sort of turned our world into this comic book version that doesn't make any sense and is really unfair to people trapped in it. So I was just sort of interested in the idea. You said in the notes that you had two sequels planned for that. <laughs> yeah, I should not shoot off my mouth. Um, <laughs> I yeah, I, I still have I still have the notes for those. Uh, but you know, if you have the if you have outlines, and it turns out that no one actually asks you for those stories, um, <laughs> they can sort of sit on your hard drive for a long time. But there's definitely a a trilogy of stories that I wanted to tell, and. Uh, at some point, I want to. I do want to get back to it. Um, talking to you makes me interested again. I hadn't thought of that that series in a couple of years. Uh, but yeah, but finally dealing dealing with this idea of um, of the Ubermensch and uh, is there a way out of this trap? Um, is there a way to get rid of him? And then after you've gotten rid of him, uh, what do you do with a world that's operating by comic book rules? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to to read those. Yeah, I hope you get back to them sometime. Okay, um, I'll do that this afternoon after we. Have. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, and in, I mean, another thing that came up in these stories a lot, sort of speaking of gods, is is there's all sorts of references to religion. And you said, um, I uh, I can see some of the themes and tropes that I'd keep coming back to in stories and novels: the Bible verses, the rural setting, the demons that aren't quite demons, the point of view character who is the guy next to the coolest guy in the room. Yeah. So talk about the, the Bible verses and the demons that aren't quite demons. Why do you think those ideas uh, come up so much? Yeah, including the novel that just came out last week. Um, uh, uh, well, I grew up, you know, in a in, in a very weird way. And I grew up in a, a Southern Baptist church. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, but my, my family is all from Tennessee, East Tennessee, the Smoky Mountains. And they came north for jobs in the 60s. And so I grew up in Chicago, uh, but going to a very Southern Baptist church and Southern Baptist in that it was also really Southern. Um, And so I grew up, you know, as a believer, but also reading science fiction. And so the cognitive dissonance between those two things sometimes uh, was very strange because uh, the lesson of fundamentalism is that this is the one true path. This is the way. Like there's the world can only work like this. And the lesson of science fiction is everything could be different. Every single thing that you take as an assumption could be different and you could be walking around in somebody else's shoes. And that's really the whole point of literature, I guess, is to let you walk around in other people's shoes. And so this, I would flip back and forth between these two different ways of looking at the world. And I finally had to uh, pick one. Um, and I'm, I'm, my parents are probably chagrined that I chose science fiction, <laughs> uh, but, uh, that stuff is in my bones. Uh, the, the, that the religious, um, you know, you read that much of the Bible growing up, uh, it's, in, you know, it's in your thought patterns. And so I can hardly write without seeing a Messiah metaphor. <laughs> it just sort of pops up naturally, but I'm really interested in this idea of, of gods that aren't quite gods, demons that aren't really demons. So like in this new book, Revelator, there's a family in the Smoky Mountains in the 1930s and 40s. And for generations, they've been worshiping their own private God. Uh, and they've declared it a God. But, it, you know, what is it really? One of the mysteries of the book is, well, what is this thing? We sort of made it into a God and it's doing things and it seems to be supernatural. But is there another science fiction explanation for it. And, um, you know, we, when you and I were talking about doing this interview, I was going to say, well, you know, one of the secrets of the book is that it's a crypto science fiction novel. I, I wrote it in such a way that it feels like horror and fantasy, but there's a scientific explanation for every single thing that's going on in the story. And I kind of love that effect. I grew up reading people like Roger Zelazny, who would mix science fiction and fantasy. Um, Heinlein did some of that too. Uh, Rachel Pollack, uh, so many great writers. And I I love that way of like flipping worldviews, maybe in the middle of the book, you know? Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, you know, um, my favorite author when I was a kid was Robert Asprin. And then 
sort of right. as a teenager was, was Roger Selassny. And both of them kind of played with this idea of demons that aren't really demons. You know, in the in Robert Aspen's myth books, uh, mm-hmm. anyone who goes to another dimension is seen as a demon by the people right. in that dimension. And it just depends on what, you know, it's just if you're different, you're seen as a demon. You know, it's not because you're evil or anything. And then in, um, you know, in The Guns of Avalon, um, which is the second Amber book, which is the first Selassie book that I read, the main character Corwin is just seen as a demon by people because he has these abilities that seem supernatural right. to them. And, and so I always, I always was really drawn to that idea of, of people who are, yeah, who are seen as evil or seen as demons through no fault of their own. It's just kind of a misunderstanding. Right. Well, and Zelazny wrote this great novel that has such an influence on me called Lord of Light, where it's basically a science fiction space opera about a far future sort of civilization that crash landed. They We learn later they came in a ship, but their high tech for some of the original crew members makes them into gods and they assume aspects of the Hindu pantheon. Um, it's fantastic. It blew my mind when I read it like sophomore year of high school. And, you know, when you read something at that age, uh, it can carve a deep groove into your brain. And so part of me, you know, still, you know, years later wants to be Rogers Lasney more than <laughs> anything. I want to grow up to be him. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you, but you said over email that Gary K. Wolf was the only person who yes. uh, deco- decoded that Revelator is really science fiction. For for your listeners, if they don't know who Gary Wolf is, he's the you know the premier edit, uh, critique uh, critic reviewer in the science fiction field. You know Gary and John Clute uh, and people like Karen Burnham. These people reading science fiction carefully, thoughtfully, and commenting on it all the time, but Gary's amazing. And he's read just about everything I've written and he sees connections that I've hidden from everyone mm-hmm. else. And he just casually tossed it in saying, well, you know, this quasi science fictional, uh, he picked up on all the clues in a way that um, a lot of readers would not. So uh, for you writers out there, if you ever get lucky enough to find someone who reads you like Gary Wolf, whether it's your partner or a reviewer, uh, that'll just make your life better because you'll you'll have that in your head saying, "Well, no one else will get this, but maybe maybe Gary will." I mean, without giving any spoilers, could you say what any of those clues were that he picked up on? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things is that so we're in the 30s and 40s, and so they don't have a lot of the language of genetics, uh, especially in you know this uh, tiny town in East Tennessee. Um, But it's clear that there's genetic experimentation going on. The god is doing something to the animals. Uh, There's work being done in their successive generations of weirdness. And so if you look at it from the outside, it's clear that this, this creature is working a problem in a very kind of scientific way over the course of decades and, you know, 200 years. Um, So, there's a way if you finish the book, there's the there's the gloss of the horror trappings because we're used to Southern Gothic being about that kind of thing. Um, but if you get to the end and you get to some of the reveals, you can go back and read how um, really you could read this whole thing from the monster's point of view. And it's uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing experiment going on for 200 years. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, actually, speaking of like connections between your books, there's one I wanted to ask you about because I just also I just read your new novella. It's called The Album of Doctor Moreau, <laughs> yeah. and uh, it's about a um a ba- like a boy band of um a sort of human animal hybrids, like from the um, yeah, H.G. of course, Wells novel The Island of Doctor Moreau. And so the fans of the like the super fans of this band are called Zoomandos. <laughs> and so, it was, so, so I read that, and then I went back and read the Unpossible Collection, and in the story, the illustrated biography of Lord Grimm, there's a line that says, "They were all veterans, former Zumandos and mechaneers and castle guards." So, yeah, I guess you really like the word Zumandos. Or... Well, it's the, it's a thing. It's like you know, it's like if if you if you come up with a clever word and no one pays attention. <laughs> Some, sometimes later in your life, like, damn it, I'm going to go use this again because you could steal from yourself and I'm not going to sue myself. So, uh, yeah, every once in a while. And, th- and so you've now entered uh, my legion of 
legion, uh, a, a small legion, of maybe three people of close <laughs> readers who've who've actually uh, found that link. But yeah, <laughs> I'm stealing from myself. Yeah, well, well, so tell us more about the album of Dr. Moreau. You said you came up with the idea on a drive between Austin and San Antonio. Yeah, me and my friend Dave Justice, we were sort of riffing, you know, and I said, oh, I've always wanted to do a, a story called the album of Dr. Moreau. I thought it'd be funny. And then we, we started doing like a behind the music. We started doing animal puns and coming up with the filthiest things that could happen if they were a Motley Crue kind of band. And it was just a we laughed for the hour and a half drive. <laughs> um and then we said, you know, we should work on this together. And then we never did. And at a certain point, I wrote to Dave saying, look, I want to go back to that story. And he's, and he's like, go with God. Uh, go ahead and write it. Um, and so then I turned it into, uh, instead of it being um, a metal band, I thought, you know, my my daughter was a huge boy band fan at the at the peak of the the Backstreet Boys and in sync around the, you know, the turn of the millennium. And it drove me nuts because <laughs> I, I was going to be the cool dad who would who would let their children listen to any kind of music and be fine with it. Uh, I didn't care if she liked country. I didn't care if she liked you know death metal. But no, she chose bubblegum pop, uh, and so I, I just was driven insane. And then, of course, it's also wired into your brain for the rest of your life. Um, so I said, "Oh, it'd be it'd be funny to do this as a boy band," and then. Um, and also to provide structure, I thought, well, it's got to be a novella. So let's let's make it a murder mystery. And I'm a huge fan of like Agatha Christie, Lock Room Murder Mysteries, that style of stuff. I thought, let's make it a classic Lock Room Mystery and an H.G. Wells uh, sequel and a boy band story and try to cram all that into 39,000 words. Uh, it's a ridiculous kind of job to do, but I had... I've never had more fun writing a book than writing that novella. Well, so, so, so the first, the story opens by listing T.S. Eliot's five rules of detective fiction. So why <laughs> did you want to include those? Well, one, it's kind of amazing that T.S. Eliot was writing reviews, critical reviews of detective fiction in the twenties. Um, so I thought that was amazing. Um, and then, so he had these, he had these rules saying, this is what makes good detective fiction. And what I decided to do was list the five rules and then I would break every one of them. Um, and uh, for example, like he don't, he says, you know, elaborate disguises should be avoided. I'm like, well, I'm going to have elaborate disguises. Hmm. Uh, he, you know, his first rule here, I'm looking. Well, I don't have it here. Um, well, yeah, I he, could give you, I could yeah. have the five rules. So it's like no no elaborate disguises. The criminal has a normal motivation. Basically, no fantasy and science fiction. No elaborate <laughs> machinery. And the detective is super smart, but not superhumanly smart. Right. And so, uh, especially like you know, the criminal should be should be uh, normal and should not have be unusual because that disturbs T. S. Eliot. So I thought, well, okay, well, the, all the suspects are going to be these human animal hybrids. There's going to be a bat boy and an <laughs> elephant boy. Um, and all of them are going to be suspects. Um, and then, but the last one I actually kind of agreed with, which is, you know, don't make the detective superhuman. And, uh, Tilly, T.S. Eliot said, you know, we should be able to follow along with, you know, uh, his reasoning. And I thought, well, there's my out is that, uh, he, he uses the male pronoun. So I'm like, I'm going to have a female detective. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it was just a nice bit of, uh, he also references in those five rules, H.G. Wells, you know, saying, well, look, all that is fine and good enough for for H.G. Wells and for scientification, uh, but that should be avoided in mysteries. I'm like, well, all right, we're going to break that big time. Yeah. And this is like it's, you know, in addition to being a great detective story and a great sort of science fiction story, it's also it's really funny. I mean, it's it's really, you know, um, one part I wanted to mention that I laughed out loud at is uh, the character Matt says, oh, they're, they're having a conversation about race as a social construct. And Matt <laughs> says, I, I don't see color. And then he's like, no, I, like I'm a bat. I literally, I don't see color. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was really funny. <laughs> yeah. And then one of them says, and then the, the dumbest one, Bobby is like, race is a construct, like like a robot. And they're like, yeah, Bobby, <laughs> race is a robot. <laughs> um, uh, the, the most fun of the book was I had these five guys who had spent, you know, who are born on a secret science barge raised by, you know, evil, uh, evil genetic engineers. 
um, and they spent all this time together. And so finding out how they would talk to each other like brothers and how each of them would have a distinct personality. So uh, that was the most fun of the book. So before I ever started really any of the plot, I would I would sit and let them talk to each other. I would just keep typing, trying to come up with dialogue. And that's where I found the book was in these five guys, the way they would bicker and the way each one of them would be funny in a different way. It was it was just a lot of fun to work on. Did you um like when you first imagined it, did you imagine it being a funny novella or did that sort of develop as you worked on it? Oh, no, that was from the beginning. And the, the only question is what kind of funny, because Dave and I, so Dave, you know, like I said, uh, the guy I was riffing with in the car, it could have been nonstop farce. Um, it could have been dirty humor. It could have been all, a whole range of things. Um, but when I came down to writing it, um, the thing I wanted to do was have them be funny, but doing it with us in a straight face, with a straight face and have it be psychologically grounded, like uh, deal with it from the point of view of how they would actually think and let the comedy come out of that um, and the reactions to things and how people are reacting to them and not just um, not just being jokes for the sake of jokes. And then I went ahead and put in a bunch of jokes for the sake of jokes uh, hmm. in that I put in a lot of puns. And so I thought, well, I have all these animal puns. And uh, so I'm going to um, have one character who won't stop and the and who works with the detective and the lead detective is like banks hmm. you you've got to stop with the you've got to stop with the puns i i can't take it <laughs> yeah at the, where he throws one in, at the end of the news conference that was another like, that <laughs> yeah. moment for me yeah uh yeah the rabid fan <laughs> <laughs> but i mean like um and i love the character bobby you know cuz cuz that was really funny but it's just grounded in his character that he's he's really he's sort of dumb and um uh affable and uh, and vain and just uh it was just always just fun when he's uh when he's talking yeah one of my writer friends calls him a himbo <laughs> like yeah. he's a yeah he's a party boy who's you know and and they're saying like well you know how could you have done all these drugs because he's got this cat he's a he's he's a hybrid of an ocelot and a human and he has this he has this great metabolism and he's doing a lot of drugs and he goes you know like why you know, why were you why were you doing all this at the party? It's like, well, you know, have you ever been really hungry and the doorbell rings and there's a guy there holding a pizza box and when he opens the pizza box, it's full of cocaine? That's what it was like. <laughs> and it's like like, okay, that's that's uh that's my Bobby. <laughs> well what well, tell us about there's this amazing um part where uh I think it's Tim uh gives this um a, yeah. you know defense of how how sophisticated and artistic their music is. Yeah. So there's Tim, the pangolin, um, who's the lyricist for the group. And uh, he said, yeah, some of my lyrics are dumb, but do not. The detective says, you know, I like how simple the songs are. He's like, do not say they are simple. So uh, my kids are both musicians. And I, and I, I wrote to Ian, my second born. I'm like, look, you're a musician and you understand pop music. Um, write me a defense of bubblegum pop about how we don't understand how sophisticated it is. And I said, I want to have a character go into a rant. So my son <laughs> wrote these two pages of pure rant um, that I was basically able to copy and paste in and just sort of put them in Tim's mouth and put in some breathing spots. Um, but it's such a lovely thing. And I'm, and for, for people out there uh, who are writers and are thinking of having kids or you have kids, uh, don't have kids just to make them write your books. But it is a nice benefit if you can get if you can get them to work for you. Um, uh, but it was a great defense because I wanted to play against the idea that my own biases, which is like, God, I hate bubblegum pop. But my, um, you know, there's uh, my son was explaining to me once about Carly Rae Jepsen. He's like, look at all the things that are going on in this song right now. And his ear as a musician was so fine. He's like, look what's happening at the high these these high pitches that that and these hi hat symbols like you don't need this stuff but look what it's doing to the music and i was like uh, it's it's amazing to have to borrow expertise and and borrow passion and enthusiasm from your kids and put that in you know when i was in grad school uh, one of the guests who came was the guy he had written um shakespeare in love 
And he mm-hmm. said that he had trained his kids to to always give them give him ideas if if they had any ideas that they thought would make a good movie to give them to him. And he's like, you know, for like twenty years or whatever, they're all I was all like, no, that's not a good idea. And then finally, he's like, his son was in college and studying Shakespeare and said, like, okay, dad, I got a great idea. It's like Shakespeare as a struggling writer. And he's like, oh, that's great. You know, and that's where Shakespeare and love came from was this uh, was from his kids, you know, see that, see that beautiful. And then um, they can sue us later. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you must I would I'd imagine you must draw on the expertise of a lot of people for these stories, because I mean, there's I'm just reading them like there's no way one person knows so much about so many different topics, right? Like, um, well, I don't know. You can tell you me. You don't know me, Dave. Do, but... No, I could be a genius. <laughs> <who wouldn't... laughs> well, here's, there, there's a couple of dirty secrets. Uh, is that one is that, um, you know, you can draw on other people and people are perfectly willing to talk to you and tell you, you know, amazing things. I, 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 I met a guy, I met him at a few conventions, um, and he'd worked at a neuroscience lab and he told me about the rat brain atlas, which is, you know, basically a book that, that, that for all the different, when you slice up a rat's brain, you could find all the different locations uh, to know what's controlling which part of the body and what functions are happening in the brain. And I thought, well, oh my God, what a great concept, the rat brain atlas. And he talked me through about how his job, uh, how he did his job every day. And that went into one of my novels, After Party. Um, but the other, but the real dirty secret is that when you're doing a short story, you can read a ton of books and you can, if you're crafty, you can make it seem like you're a genius. Or if you're writing about a genius, like in Dead Horse Point, the story you mentioned, I'm not a physicist, but I can read enough books about physics and pick and choose to say what she is talking about to give you the impression that she knows a lot more that's not on the page. But the the sad fact is a lot of times for short stories, like I wrote, there's a there's a short story that was nominated for a Hugo that's all about plant biology. And I read maybe five or six books for to do that novelette. Um, and everything I sort of learned is in the story and not an ounce more. So everything <laughs> is on the page. And if you asked me to go any deeper about any of this stuff, I wouldn't be able to do it. I'd have to go back to the books. Well, right. And especially for a short story, I mean, one paragraph is really all you like. I was thinking of the story um, uh, about the, the dad whose body produces the drug. Uh, what we take when we take oh, what yeah. we need. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't that story. It was the continuing adventures of Rocket Boy. When, when the, the guy is um, he comes back to his hometown and he's, um, you know, he has some job analyzing data on the computer. And he just gives this he's talking to the, the neighbor dad and just gives this sort of one paragraph speech about what his job entails and i was like i totally believe that that this is your job or that this is your job daryl gregory or you talk to someone who has this job or something because it just felt so dead on oh accurate. i i've all right so there's a confession i worked for 25 years for a statistical software company called <laughs> okay. and i wrote i wrote the technical documentation and did programming for them and so that was that was you know a a, a water cooler chat so, and it's one of the few times I was able to use anything from 25 years at Minitab. I'm like, well, here's a, here, I, the whole 25 years are worth it. I got one paragraph out of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a part in the book where um, there's, there, he's talking to Matt, the, the bat hybrid character, or I guess uh, uh-huh. the detective, the detectives are talking to Matt. And, um, and he says, he gives this, he, he's sort of talking about detective fiction And he says, science fiction gives you no closure, at least in a mystery or thriller, you return to the status quo. But in SF, it's all epiphanies and trapdoors and space babies, space babies all the way down. I was just (laughs) curious if you do agree with that or where that come from. Uh, I do. I I do agree with that. I think um, one of the differences between thrillers and science fiction is that uh, when Michael Crichton writes writes a, a thriller, even though it has science fictional elements, the whole point of the story is that you return to the status quo. The world is saved. We all get to go back to their lives. Um, you know, the, the, the robots of Westworld are put down. We've escaped. Uh, we've, uh, yeah, we basically, uh, we've, we put the bad thing away. Um, the lesson of science fiction is we're at the end of the story, we're going to kick the doors open. Like this is only the tip of the iceberg that everything at the end of the science fiction novel 
is ready to change again. And so the Space Babies is obviously a reference to, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey, where, you know, you pull back and you're at the end of this kind of bewildering movie and it's about to get even weirder. There's something <laughs> new created in the universe and it's Space Babies all the way down. And I've always loved that about science fiction, that it's, uh, in some ways it shares something with horror and that the horror is never over. There's always the, uh, the little uh, uh, Philip at the end of that the horror can come back at any time. In science fiction, it's, a, it's just that the world is about to change um, and we can't even know all the ways that it's about to change. Right. But it's always kind of a trick, right? Because, you know, you want the ending of a science fiction novel to be to just totally blow your mind. But there's only so many mind blowing things <laughs> out there. So you right. kind of have to convey this sense of mind blowingness, even if you don't necessarily have anything mind blowing, you know. Well, you do. To... And so what you all you have to you have to do a couple of things. Um, every novel no matter the genre is it has to feel like you've come to an emotional uh, you've come home. Like we talked about, you've come full circle. You've, you've come to some sort of revolution uh, resolution emotionally, but then um, one more thing is about to get very weird. And so it doesn't have to be very much, but, it, but if you can leave the viewer saying, Oh, what happens next and it's over and they have to sort of decide for themselves what would be the next thing. That's sort of a beautiful thing that science fiction can do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. We're pretty much out of time. I guess one thing I, I did want to ask you before you go is, you know, I mentioned you, you said you had the idea for this book while driving between um, Austin and San Antonio. Mm -hmm. And I actually live in San Marcos, which is between Austin and San Antonio. So I was just wondering, Okay. What were, you, what were you doing? Uh, what were you doing there? There were two. There was the San Antonio Book Festival going on, and then in um, oh, actually, I have it reversed because I've been to the San Antonio Book Festival, but I think that trip was um, there was the Austin. There was the book festival going on in Austin, and World Fantasy Convention was going on in San Antonio, and. Uh, believe I have that right. It was going, um, yeah, it was the book festival in Austin because we were heading south. Um, uh, but that, I, I love, you know, I love the Austin area. Um, and I was really kind of thrilled to go to the San Antonio book festival and see how energized people were uh, uh, about reading. It's a, just a, it's a lovely thing that you've got going down there. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, um, my, my girlfriend's doing an MFA in creative writing at Texas State. So that's what brought us to San Marcos. And we've been here for about two years. And unfortunately, it was kind of two years that overlapped with the global pandemic. So that we haven't actually seen <laughs> our area all that much. Right. But, you've, uh, you've, had a, you've had a tough couple of years, man. You've had, the, um, you've had the power grid go down and you had to blame it all on the... Um, on the windmills. You've had a tough, you've had a tough time. Yeah. Yeah. I won't even go there. There've been some other things, but I don't want to bring the conversation <laughs> <Right>. down, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, but other, you know, other than, than some of those things, I mean, it's a gorgeous area. So if, you know, if you're ever in the uh, Austin area again, you know, I should stop by San Marcos. There's a great tubing and hiking and stuff here. Oh, really? All right. That, that sounds, that sounds fantastic. I, I, I will say that, you know, my friends who live in Austin, I once did a writer's retreat with a bunch of friends in a house. And, uh, and I was like, so every day it's 105. They're like, yeah, it's August. <laughs> this is just what we do yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't come don't come in August if you can avoid it. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, all right, cool. So, um, do you have any, uh, any other final thoughts or other projects you want to let people know about? No. Uh, uh, like I said, Revelator is out now. Album of Dr. Moreau is out right now. And, uh, there's short stories coming down the pike and, um, uh, I'm just I'm just happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Dave. This has been a this has been a, a blast. Yeah, yeah, it's been so much fun. Uh, and so we've been speaking with Daryl Gregory about his books Unpossible and the album of Dr. Moreau. So Daryl, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Dave. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Daryl Gregory for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks, 
or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.